Okay, let's have a lesson on this Prelude or Preludio by Roncalli. This is originally for Baroque guitar, so we'll be talking about that a little bit. Um, if you already have the sheet music for this piece, um, just follow the lesson for free and pick up all the tips and everything like that. But if you're interested, this comes from my Grade 6 Repertoire Lessons book. And in my book, there's a few pages of lesson material before each piece to teach you um, not only how to play the piece and how to better practice the piece, but also general concepts about learning guitar and, and music in general. So there's so a link for that underneath the video if you're interested. So I'm going to be going over a number of things in the video, so I'll also put times in the description so you can jump ahead if you don't want to cover certain things that are in the book and you just want the walkthrough of the piece, for example. First thing we're going to do is go over some scales with multiple different fingerings. It's the same scale, it's going to be a D minor scale, but with many different fingerings involved. Then we're going to go over that freely arpeggiated chord at the beginning, um, having to do with kind of free ornamentation and embellishment. Then we're going to have a just, well, we'll do a walkthrough, but I'll also be talking about the motifs and the sequences and the cadences in this piece and the significance of that. So that might be interesting to you um, for other pieces that you might be practicing. So let's begin. We're going to first play three natural minor scales with different types of shifts. So a natural minor scale just follows the key signature, in this case B flat. Um, D minor is the relative minor of F major. So we'll have three different scales, natural minor scales, and we're going to shift in different ways on each scale. This um, will help you learn different areas of the fingerboard, so it allows you to study fingerboard knowledge, but also different ways of shifting. So we're going to shift on different strings, sometimes on an open string, for example, and we'll talk about the significance of that. So the first scale will be a D natural minor, shifting on the first string. <laughs> shift up the first string, keep your first finger on the string as a guide finger. So you can just leave that finger down to guide you up to the fifth fret with a little bit more security. Next scale, um, well the same scale, D natural minor, shifting on the second string this time. Shift up with a guide finger, leaving your first finger on that second string. The next one is D natural minor with an open string shift. And open string shifts are not practiced nearly enough in people's scales, and yet they're the most commonly used um, type of shift in our repertoire. So that's when you have an open string and you shift into upper position while that open string is ringing out. Much easier to shift if there's sound happening. You don't have to be quite as precise. Well, you still do, but it's an excellent way to shift and allow it to still be legato. So we use it in repertoire a lot, but it's rarely in scale books. So you can see like while that E is ringing out, I can shift up and play the F on the second string. A great way to, to shift in your repertoire. Okay, just two more scales and that'll be it for the scale section. Um, a harmonic minor scale with an open string shift. So harmonic minor scales raise the seventh degree. So in this case, it makes the C a C sharp. minor with an open string shift. Melodic minors raise the 6th and 7th degree while ascending through the scale. 
While descending through the scale, we return to the natural minor scale, so just the key signature. <laughs> that as you progress through the books, my various graded books, that all the scale practice and different ways of shifting and different areas of the guitar will help you learn the guitar really well and um, also get an idea of what kind of shifts are available to you. Okay, the arpeggiated chord at the beginning of this piece. In the original Baroque um, guitar tablature, it, there's just a, um, a symbol for this chord, so it's not notated specifically. And it's pr probably unlikely that a um, someone from that time period would just play the chord and then start playing the piece. It's possible, and you can do that for sure, but I think um, some embellishment is definitely um, in order here. In my book, I've written out a possible embellishment and realization, um, which goes like this. Um, you have a fermata, play the chord, fermata, and then speed up, ritardando, fermata, start the piece. I've written it out so that there's a metric version of it, so it's the proper number of beats and everything, and that you have something to, to start your process with. You can do all sorts of things though. Lots of different things you could do with that chord to embellishment, but I'll leave it up to you, but just experiment. The best way to get an idea for all this, all these things is to listen to a lot of Baroque guitar and a lot of lute. If you listen to a lot of performances of music, you'll, you'll hear what kind of embellishments performers use. That's the most natural way of, of getting an idea how to do this. You can read a lot up on books and things like that and get lots of academic knowledge as well but you need to stylistically just know what people are doing with these things. So listening to a lot of music is, is the best choice. So now we're gonna go through the piece talking about the motifs and the imitation that exists in the piece. So a motif is just a small musical idea. Um, it's, it's like a unique, it has a unique musical identity. It can be long or short, it can be based on chords or based on melody. It can be rhythmic. It's just an idea. Or you could also call it a theme, but sometimes it's so small that you wouldn't necessarily call it that. In this piece, we kind of start off with the motif. So I call this motif one. And we'll do a walkthrough of the piece as we go here. So we've already talked about this chord. Motif one. imitation of that motif in the bass voice. You know, there might be some chords in there as well, but, but you have that same motif presented in the lower voice. And you also have that cadence there. But don't get too distracted by the vertical chords. Make sure you're getting the motifs in a horizontal way. Then you have a new a little motif, I'll call it motif number two. We have to jump the first finger there. There's not much we can do about that. Then we get a, the same motif after that, but it's a little bit altered, it's not exactly the same. similar sounding though so you still kind of get that motif number two then we get a sequence and a sequence is kind of um, a, a repetition of motivic elements usually in close proximity to each other so in this case the sequence ends up being uh, let's see that kind of um, eighth note rhythm, there's one, there's another one, there's another one, there's another one, and 
then you're done. So like a kind of a, a very repetitive little tiny figuration, right? And across that, you get these musical lines, like in the bass voice. lines that go across it. Same thing with the upper voice. G, F, E, D, E. Then that's from motif number one. You, know, you get just a hint of this is also a sequence through here. sequence there has D and then the next one C and then B flat and then the cadence in F. By the way the chords in this, um, the chords are all with Raschietto and um, on Baroque guitar, because Baroque guitar has double sets of strings, um, chord strumming sounds a little bit different. Um, it's the string tension's lower, it's kind of a plucky sound. So you get this, um, it's it's not quite as aggressive when you strum on, on the instrument. On the modern guitar, it's kind of quite a statement when you do the raschietto. So I'll leave it up to you. If you don't want to do what I'm doing, which is back of the I finger, up, then all three, all three fingers at the end. If you don't want to do that, if you think it's a little too much, then you can just arpeggiate those chords or, you know, strum them or, or however you feel is appropriate. I decided to, to kind of go with that, that as a very strong statement. Okay, let's continue on with this exploration of the motifs. So we just ended with that cadence. And then we're in upper position now in bar 10. So that's theme one, right? It's from the beginning. Bar 10. Now, when we get to this part here, we have a little tiny motif. I'm gonna call it motif number three. And that's the upper voice, lower voice, upper voice. So da ba ba ba. The tricky thing in this section is that the motifs start to get really close to, together and they share their final note. So at the end of one motif number three, the, it's the beginning of another one. So you have this like chain link effect of motifs. So the composer is taking up these motifs and crunching them together in, in close proximity um, and throwing it in upper voice, lower voice, middle voice, like all over the place. So you get a lot of activity, which is makes sense. It's near the end of the piece. It's kind of like a climax of motifs. So um, I'll just kind of try to narrate as I go, but I, I can't say, because they overlap, I can't speak about two motifs at once. So it'll, it'll be a little bit confusing, but I'll go for it. That's motif number one, upper voice, lower voice, upper voice, lower voice, upper voice, lower voice, upper voice, lower voice, middle voice, upper voice, middle voice, upper voice, middle voice, upper voice, lower voice, upper voice, then chord, then Motif number one. And that uh, freely arpeggiated chord again at the end. So what one curious thing about that motif number three is that sometimes the note gets displaced by an octave. So like at the end of bar 13, this high C is the first note of the lower motif, which is D, E, F, C, D, E, F. 
If it was on its own, it'd probably be a C down here. But it's not. They sh they're sharing notes and there's some displacement in the octave. So it, it, you don't have to get too into it, but just know that there's a lot of that motif um, being scrambled up um, in one area. Um, one other thing is in bar 14, there's some shifts that you just have to deal with, but you do it on the long note. You can't actually hold this high A at the end of 14 um, because you have to get down there. Just hold it as long as possible and don't short change it. Um, and on bar 16, that's kind of a tough chord to get. It's just a little bit awkward. So just make sure that using the fourth finger as a guide finger and that in midair, you're preparing these two fingers over the, st over the strings so you can grab it. This is just a little ornament. So pull off, hammer on, pull off. And I do it with four, three, so that you can sustain the C sharp and then play your D minor chord. Or if, if, you, if you decide to arpeggiate, you can maybe do it differently. The Baroque prelude um, was often quite free sounding um, in some lute works, but in other works, maybe such as this one, and certainly the works of Bach, um, it's a little bit more strict. You still want a feeling of improvisation and a feeling of um, a kind of unfolding. Preludes often introduced other movements in a suite and it would introduce some of the motifs maybe or the harmonies of the piece. And so um, preludes were often an exploration of those um, harmonies and motifs. So they could be free, but in the case of Bach, for example, they're quite strict um, to some extent. Um, and same thing here. Um, you have some opportunity to bring out the motifs and use a little bit of rubato for that. But for the most part, you do want to keep the rhythm secure and, and make sure you're, you're going through the phrases quite nicely. So I, I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, next we'll be moving on to the classical era in the book.